Father in heaven, we want to thank you for uh, this Sabbath, for the freedom that we enjoy this morning to come together with family and friends in the sanctuary to worship our Creator and our Savior. And Lord, as we do that, we ask that you would take the cares of this world, the thoughts of work and school or any worldly thing aside, that um, our hearts and our minds would be uh, open to fellowship with you. Um, we pray for your holy angels to be here, Lord, and for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, to guide us into all truth. We give you the praise and the glory, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We welcome each of you to Tullahoma Seventh-day Adventist Church and uh, hope that you have been uh, already blessed from our worship that we had this morning. It's our lesson study, and uh, we just praise God to be alive today. Uh, it is a blessing every day because we should not take that for granted. You know, um, we are blessed to be alive every day. Um, this morning, um, there are going to be a couple of announcements. I'm going to ask Cindy if she'll come up and go ahead and talk a little bit about our yard sale. And then I have a, a couple things to share also. Good morning. Um, I realize that we haven't been keeping you guys <clears throat> well up to date on what's happening out there at our school. So um, we, we had a little surprise visit from the Kentucky 10 education superintendent, Dr. Peggy Flint, stopped by unannounced. And um, she was so absolutely happy with what she saw going on out there that she um, is encouraging us now to go ahead and promote the preschool program. We have, I believe, five students. Is that correct, Jimmy? Five or six. And we were told we had to have 10. But now what she sees what's happening out there. She just is encouraging us to promote the preschool program to take out the rest of the, make the numbers correct. And um, so that's what we're doing. And we will still continue to need the funds that we will be bringing in through the yard sale, which begins this evening. As soon as the sun goes down, I forgot to look and see what time the sun goes down, but you guys all know how to do that. And we will meet here. Anybody who's able-bodied, how many of that is out here? We got a bunch. I can see. We need to bring what is over in that building into this building. So um, we all, 7.15, we'll be here at 7.15. We'll have a little prayer over our project. We need to remove all the chairs from out of the fellowship hall and get things swapped over. So that's one need. Another need we also will have is volunteers to help organize and volunteers to help do the sale. We need people who are good with numbers to cash people out, which is not me. So um, I, normally we have Nona, are you going to be available? And Marsha's really good at it. But if you don't feel like you have the energy to put into the sale, if you don't think you can keep up with Vera and Flo, then we could use help just providing food for the staff that are there and a meal. We would need one Friday the 19th. We would need one Sunday the 21st and Monday the 22nd. The 23rd, we will be cleaning up and moving out, and we don't ever have time to eat on that day. So it would be awesome. Come see me. I will stay for lunch today. You'll have plenty of time to come and offer me your services, and I will be um, looking for each one of you. Thank you. It's going to be more than just the shed because I have a 6 by 12 enclosed trailer that is full all the way to the top from front to back with stuff from the Deckard sale. Excellent. And Excellent. so that's also going to need to be unloaded and put in. in yes, too. lots of work tonight. So eat a good lunch, take maybe a little afternoon nap, and then let's do it.
For those of you who may not know, uh, we have received um, our FCC licensing, and um, so we can go ahead and proceed uh, with our next steps for the uh, radio station. And um, we are going to need some funds to help cover some of those expenses that will be coming in around $4,200. And so make sure that uh, you mark that on your tithe envelope if you turn that in um, as we move forward with the radio station, which is very important um, part of what uh, this church is going to do as an outreach in our community. And so uh, be thinking about that as we proceed forward. Okay, we'll go ahead and proceed with our, um, by the way, there are blue cards, I think they're still blue, uh, in the, in the your back of the pew in front of you for if anybody that wants to turn in a prayer request. And we here at Tullahoma are praying church, right, Billy? Amen. Yes, and so um, if you have a request, uh, the ushers will pick that up at the last stanza of our opening hymn. So let's not forget that, too. And that will have our song service. Thank you, Cliff. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Man, it's a beautiful, sunshiny day, isn't it? On this April 13th, can anybody think of a real prominent uh, 413 verse? Philippians 413, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Let's begin with page 608. Um, faith is the victory. And we got Zach back there on DJing the digital music for us. Thank you, sir. Let's sing victoriously. Amen. Upon the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Drawn up in dread array, let tents of ease be left behind, and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head, with truth all gird about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread, and echo with our shout, which says, Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know His name confessed in heaven Then onward from the hills of light Our hearts with love aflame Will vanquish all the hosts of night In Jesus' conquering name, amen Faith is the victory Faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. Y'all sound wonderful. Would y'all stand with me, the opening hymn? 
page 600, hold fast till I come. And like Cliff said, if you got those prayer cards ready, we'll be coming to get them at the third verse. Another thing that is very important, and that is Hope Channel. How many of you watch Hope Channel? Okay, there's quite a few of you who watch this Hope Channel. I get all of those channels. I have the MySDA TV box, and so I can get Hope Channel. It is Written Channel, Amazing Facts Channel, 3ABN, all of their channels, radio, anything. I can get all of that on my SDA TV box. And um, Hope Channel is one of those that I do watch quite often because I do like their SAB school because they actually have the teacher of the quarterly there with them sharing the SAB school lesson every week. And so our offering today is for Hope Channel. And it can continue to share that uh, we want that because that way it can continue to share the transformational love of Jesus Christ with people all over the world uh, by producing high-quality Christian content to reach new audiences in innovative ways. And it says that our HOPE study platform is online and offers Bible studies on a range of topics, and so far, 
over 300,000 people have started a course. Let's hear that again. Amen. Yes. In just one year after the platform went live, people are hungering for Bible truths. Do we believe that? People are hungering for Bible truths. I believe that with all my heart, and I know that the closer we get to the final movements of this earth's history, the more people's hearts are going to be turned to God, and they're going to want to know what is happening and why things are happening. And so after celebrating 20 years of Hope Channel and reaching over 80 countries with the Adventist message, let's make 2024 the most impactful year yet in sharing hope in Jesus with people everywhere. If our deacons will stand. Our loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to share this gospel in so many different ways throughout the world. Yes, we can sit here in our own homes and in the pews of this church, and yet the gospel is going out all over the world, and we can be a part of that. And so I just pray that you'll be with the offering today. Bless each one, and may uh, all that we do for you, may it glorify you, and may your coming be soon because we are willing to give not only of our means, but our hearts to you. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glad to be here. Um, as the health ministries director in Murfreesboro, I was uh, thrilled to have Marcia ask me to share a health nugget this morning. She's not able to be here. Um, just waiting for the screen. There we go. We'll uh, have something up there. You should have an insert in your bulletin. If not, see me afterwards. I'll get it for you. You can put it on your fridge or whatever. Um, so why is this health, uh, you know, why we do a health message? Why is it important as Christians? Um, you know, we're told that health reform, the medical missionary work, is to be an entering wedge, right? Um, and that the health message is the right arm uh, of the gospel. And so if, if we're known for our health message, um, you know, for taking care of the temple of God, taking care of our bodies, proper eating, diet, lifestyle. Uh, the world is looking to see, is it working? Um, all right, I don't know what's going on here. Let's see if we can get this full screen. Yeah, it's not working. <clears throat> All right, there we go. Um, so anyway, I want to talk to you about uh, cancer and casein. Um, the Bible tells us that God's desire is that we would prosper and be in health, um, even as the soul prospereth. So 
Um, again, you know, as representatives of God in the remnant church with a health message, people are looking to see, are they, are they living uh, and experiencing the blessings of, you know, rightful living, taking care of your bodies? Do we have more energy than others? Are we more clear-minded to receive what the Holy Spirit um, has for us? Or are we plagued with the same sicknesses and diseases that everyone else has? And so this issue of cancer um, is a big one because cancer is the second leading cause of death here in Tennessee and throughout the United States. Um, and it takes the lives of over 600,000 people every year. Second only to heart disease, which interestingly is also a lifestyle disease. Uh, many cancers, as we'll see, are uh, related to what we are doing, not doing, and putting into our bodies. So casein is the primary protein found in milk. Some of you may already know that. Maybe you don't. Um, but casein is found in a large number of foods. And I've listed some here. Um, it's also in the handout. Yogurt, all types of dairy, cheese, cheese products, ice cream, creamers, cookies, pies, crackers, chips, pastries, cakes, whole milk, skim milk, butter, salad dressings, gravies, and numerous processed foods. If you start reading labels, you will see this ingredient because it's often left over when they process milk to do some other things. And they have so much of it, they want to put it in everything. Um, if so, if it came from a cow, it has casein in it. Now, Dr. T. Colin Campbell, he wrote the book with his son, uh, The China Study, and they spent over 25 years studying uh, these cancer-causing agents, and they found, and he said this, casein, and likely most other animal proteins, is a far more relevant carcinogen than any pesticide, herbicide, food additive, or other noxious chemical ever tested. What does that mean? In layman's terms, he's saying, that after all of the testing, it's the most carcinogenic substance he's come across. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, so you know what a carcinogen is. Uh, it's a cancer-causing agent. In other words, any substance that promotes the growth of cancer cells. Carcinogens change our DNA, and they disrupt cellular processes. And, of course, that's not good. And that's not good at all. And you know what's interesting is millions of people pay good money to consume what Dr. Campbell says is the most cancer-causing substance. We pay good money to do it, to in inhale it into our bodies. And, you know, it has a high satisfaction level. You know, before I was an Adventist, um, I was like, you know, most people ate cheese. There's a reason that it satisfies when you eat it um, because it fills the stomach and it stays there for a very long time. Um, the body has a very hard time processing it, and it's often something that they serve as an hors d'oeuvre before a reception to keep uh, the guests quiet um, because they often come wanting to eat. And so if our bodies, if we believe what Scripture says, that they are the temple of the Holy Spirit, um, we would want to do what is best for the temple. Ellen White said this, cheese should never be introduced into the stomach. Why? Cheese is a very concentrated form of casein. Um, interestingly, back in Ellen White's day, uh, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, at a camp meeting with Ellen White, um, he, uh, he ended up going into the grocery on the campus where they were having camp meeting and buying all of the cheese so that people would not buy it and consume it. Because they had determined prior to camp meeting that they would not sell cheese, but someone brought in a large quantity into the grocery store to sell it. And <clears throat> he decided, I can afford it. I will buy this substance because it, is, it has a very injurious effect on the human body. And so he didn't want it to be sold, so he bought it all. Ellen White said this, she, speaking of Dr. Kellogg, she said, he traced the matter from cause to effect and knew that some foods generally thought to be wholesome were very injurious. So he knew that uh, th these things are not good for our bodies. They're dangerous. And, you know, um, dairy is often thought to have a good source of calcium and protein, and the dairy industry promotes you know, uh, the use of dairy products. 
when in fact the opposite is true. The calcium in dairy products is not readily absorbed. Um, as a matter of fact, because it creates an acid base, your bones and your body are robbed of calcium in order to neutralize the pH from the dairy. So it actually lowers your calcium. Um, it's, it's not a good source of calcium. And we can get protein um, from many sources. You don't need milk to do it. And we just learned that the milk protein casein is a very high cancer-causing agent. Um, as I draw to a close here, I want you to read this. Uh, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And so the Bible is specific that we can bring glory to God in what we eat or drink or whatever we do. And we should have that desire. We want to glorify God in everything that we do. Um, I would want uh, the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit, to be in the best physical condition possible. Um, I hope you would too, that you would want the Holy Spirit to be able to reach you with, uh, through your mind. And we know that the things that we consume have a direct effect on our minds, our thinking, uh, on our bodies. And, you know, we rob God of our service if we are ill um, and it's self-inflicted by our lifestyle. If we're laid up in the hospital, if we're laid up in bed, if we're sick all the time, if we're, you know, constantly having to visit the doctor, go to the hospital, because we've chosen to violate health principles, we rob God of his ability to use us powerfully in his service. So let's keep that in mind. And, uh, you know, I encourage you to uh, try to read labels, avoid those dairy products, and look for that word casein and set it aside because it causes cancer. All right. Thank you. And so now it's time for a children's story. And... Uh, Phyllis is going to have our children's story for us today. So if you'll come up, uh, children, and get your basket and do it quickly and quietly. And don't forget the platform.
Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I have a word for you guys today. Could you hold that word up and show the, everyone the word we're going to be talking about today? <coughs> what is that word? Promises. Do anybody have any idea what that might mean? Uh, yes. Okay. What you say? Yes. Okay, did not lie. Promise it. Yes, I'm listening. Oh, she took what you was going to say. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Promises is, is you're going to do what you say you're going to do. How about that? It's your, it's your word. You gave someone your word. Standing on the promises. I, I brought three scriptures that I like that's promises, standing on God's promises. One of them is Isaiah 59, 19. It says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Then I have another one in Isaiah 49, 25. It says, for I will contend with him that contend with me, and I will save thou children. Did you hear that, big children? For I will contend with him that contend with me, and I will save thou children. And then I have one more. Numbers 23, 19. It says, God. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said, or and shall not he do it, or has he spoken it, shall not he make it good? See, God keeps his promises. You hear what I just read, Numbers 23, 19? Whatever he says, he's going to do that. That is one of God's promises. And I want to share a story with you. Because I had to use one of these uh, scriptures, promises, when I was going through this ordeal. It happened a long time ago. My mom was in the hospital, and she was trying to tell them that her pressure and sugar was dropping. But, you know, the doctor would say, oh, no, it's okay, you fine, and all of this. And she was trying to tell them, no, you can't go by the books with me. You know, I'm trying to tell you. They did not listen. And guess what happened? She bought them out. And the doctors got to running, cold and cold blue and all like this. I was in the room. And I, you know what? I ran out and I said, Lord, you said, you said, Jesus, if the enemy would come in like a flood, you'll lift up a standard against me. I said, Lord, you said, you said. And then they had the, the family in the waiting room. They sent in the chaplain because it wasn't looking good. They thought my mom was dying. And then, you know what, they was crying and carrying on. I said, you know what, I just got to, I got to go talk to Jesus. I got to have another talk with Jesus. And then I went to another room, and I was praying, claiming God's promises. And you may have your own promises. And um, then maybe about five or ten minutes ago, the same nurse come into the waiting room. They say, it's a miracle. We don't know what happened. Your mom is sitting up, and she's talking. And I said, Lord, thank you. See. You have to learn promises, and when things are happening to you, if you give God back his promises, don't you know he'll do it? I read to you and say, Numbers 23, 19, he can't lie. What he say, he'll do it. So I also have a sheet of, of promises that you could do. Do any of you have a promises that you might want to share, that you might know of? I gave you three of mine. These are three of my favorite uh, promises of, out of God's word. Do you have any? No? Well, after I get done, you're going to have a whole list of them, of God's promises. No matter what you're going through, whatever you're doing, whatever um, problems you may be having, even if a dog is after you. Did you know you can claim God's promises and, and he will stop the dog? That didn't happen to me before. I was out doing Bible work, and the dog looked like he was going to contact me. And I gave him one in God's word. I said, no, I'm out here doing Jesus' work, and you got to stop. And the dog stopped in his track and didn't come. You got to clap. Yes. You got to <laughs> But that's okay. But now, he, now Abney, Abdeen would know what to do. And listen at this. And listen at this. This is in Desire of Ages, page 113, paragraph 1. Listen at this. It says, the human voice may reach the ear of God. Did you hear that? When you pray and claim his promises, it says the human voice may reach the, the ear of God. He can't lie. If you give him his promises, he would do them. 
and our petition find acceptance in the courts of heaven. Isn't that beautiful? So remember, no matter what you're going through or what you might encounter, start learning the promises of God so you have ammunition against the devil. That's what the Lord wanted me to share with you today, claiming his promises, standing on his promises, and no matter what's going on, he will come through for you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your love. Lord, thank you for your Sabbath day. Lord, thank you for all the many promises you have given us in your word. And Lord, we ask you that you would help us to put your promises in our memory, to remember them. And as we go throughout the day and whatever may come our way, that Lord, we can dart your promises up to you. And Lord, you would come through and rescue us. And we just thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath. It's time for prayer. And we have a few prayer requests this morning that we're going to present for the Lord. Our first one is, I pray for my mom and family. This is definitely from a young person. This one is Heavenly Father. Thank you for the beauty all around us. Please continue prayer for Richard's Holly, Linda's healing. Please help for the success of the yard sale for the church school. Please provide traveling mercies to my sisters and family traveling from Syracuse, New York this week. Please keep us all healthy for this visit. Please continue to pray for Tammy's co-worker, daughter and family. Please continue prayer for friend Sharon Parrish that she may continue to breathe as her lungs are continually to struggle to breathe. Please give her peace. Thank you for all of your provisions for life. And this is from Mary. Praise for the Manchester Spanish SDA Church. Prayer for God to continue to protect and guide them. Richard is continuing to ask prayer for his wife, Holly. And this one is, please keep praying for Lexi, that the Lord will heal her real soon and that she will open her heart and serve Jesus. Are there any unspoken prayers? I'd like to read a brief statement here. <clears throat> From Councils on Health. <clears throat> it says, there are precious promises in the scriptures to those who wait upon the Lord. We all desire an immediate answer to our prayers and are tempted to become discouraged if our prayers are not answered immediately. My experience has shown me that delay is for our special benefit. Did you hear that? We have a chance to see whether our faith is true and sincere or changeable like the waves of the sea. We must bind ourselves upon the altar with the strong cords of faith and love and let patience have her perfect work. God hears our prayers, brothers and sisters. 
and sometimes he tests our faith. But as we come collectively, lifting up these prayer requests and those personal prayer requests that you have in your heart, for whatever reason it may be, your children, financial, or whatever the case may be, God wants us to what? Pray and depend on him. So let's go to the majesty of heaven. Father in heaven, Lord, we are grateful and thankful that we can come boldly before thy throne of grace, mm -hmm. but also we come humbly on bending knees, knowing, Father, that our sole dependence is not on us, but on you. We know, Father, that you are in the heavenly sanctuary interceding in our behalf, mm -hmm. and you desire to hear the prayers of your children. And, Father, we have a few prayer requests here that has been publicly mentioned. And, Lord, we ask, Lord, in a special way that as they were presented to you, as Hezekiah presented a letter to you, that you would answer each one accordingly, Lord as they have been presented. And Lord, there are prayer requests that have been unmentioned, but Lord, you are not short. You also hear each one. And we're grateful and thankful, Lord, that you are so happy when we come and lay our petitions at your feet. So Lord, we are asking that you would answer each one according to your will. Please remember us, Father, and forgive us for our shortcomings. Forgive us for our sins, thoughts, words, and deeds. Lord, we don't want anything to hinder these precious, precious petitions that have gone up before thee. And Lord, we know that whatsoever we ask, you heareth us. And if we know that you hear us, Lord, we know that we have that petition that we desire thee. So we thank you in a special way, Father, for answering our prayers. And we also, Father, take this moment to lift up your manservant of the hour as he breaks the bread of life. Lord, we ask that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to obey. Please, Father, pour out your spirit in a mighty way. And as always, Father, we are careful to give you the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
In Christ our wisdom we are humble when you hide your ways from us. You have purposes unnumbered, each one good and glorious. Help us trust when we grow weary, free us from our anxious thoughts. And give us grace to see more clearly You are God and we are not In Christ our wisdom be our gladness When we fail to understand you ordain all joy and, and sadness to fulfill your perfect plan. Help us know you rule with power over every raging flood in our most uncertain hour. You are God, and we are love. In Christ our wisdom we will follow, though the way ahead is veiled. As we journey through the shadows, Grant us faith where sight is failed. Help us cling to your commandments, strengthened by your faithful word. We will never be abandoned. You are God and we are yours. Christ our wisdom, we adore you for the beauty of the cross. Once in foolishness we scorned you, but your blood has ransomed us. Help us sing the endless mercies of your humble heart to save in christ our wisdom christ our glory you are god forever praise help us sing the endless mercies of your humble heart to save in christ our wisdom Christ our glory, you are God forever praise. And the church said, Our scripture comes to us this morning from Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to those four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. I don't know about you, but I want to be sealed.
morning again, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Glad to see you. The title of the message, The Seal of God. Um, <clears throat> and so I guess the first question is, would you like to, like Cliff, receive the seal of God? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, that we are free to come together to study your word um, this morning. We ask, Father, that as we do that, that the Holy Spirit would be poured out, not only on me, but on everyone here, that you would speak through me and that our hearts and our minds would be open and we'll give you the honor and glory in Jesus' name, amen. It's a vital principle, uh, the seal of God. And again, our scripture reading here, after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on any sea or on any tree. So it's symbolically in Revelation, you see um, difficulty, strife, uh, Satan wanting to just bring mayhem. And God is telling the angels, you just hold things, hold things back. <clears throat> I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. So those angels, they have power to just let things go. But God has a work to do. And so you see this angel coming that has the seal of the living God. That's the seal that we want. And, <clears throat> and the, the message is saying, hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, so we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. So this is not about the sea or the earth or the trees. Um, you know, th that's not the concern. The concern is that God's people have an opportunity to be sealed. And, and when you see, when you read, hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, it's talking about just continue to hold back uh, the mayhem that Satan is trying to bring. And this, pro this process of sealing is just that. It's a process. It's step by step. The Lord is taking us through uh, trials and through life, and He is trying to impart truth. He's pleading with us to accept each point of truth, um, to accept His love, to embrace Him. So He's leading us onward and upward to the point where we are able to receive the seal of God. <clears throat> so God's seal con contains three important things, his name, his title, and what else? His territory. So his name is the Lord, his title is creator, and his territory, as far as we're concerned, is heaven and earth and the sea, right? And all that that encompasses. So his seal, interestingly, is found in the heart of his law, the Ten Commandments. And so we look at it here, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. So his seal is printed there in the heart of the Ten Commandments, in the Sabbath commandment. We see his name, the Lord. We see his title, the creator. And we see his territory, heaven and earth and the sea. And I may have mentioned this before, but without the Sabbath commandment, if you remove the fourth commandment from the Decalogue, you would not be able to prove whose law it was. Someone could say, that's Baal's law. I worship Baal and this is his law. But no, in the fourth commandment, it identifies the lawgiver, the lawmaker. As the creator, God of heaven, could be no one else. And so he, he is identified there. His seal is found in the Sabbath commandment. So uh, we read there in Revelation chapter 7, and it mentions the seal being received in the forehead. And Hebrews 8.10 backs it up. But God says, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. So if you think about the mind, the frontal lobe, where we make decisions, where we reason things out, <clears throat> God desires to seal us there because it's, it is a decision that we make. We purpose in our hearts to do certain things so that God can seal us. 
This is from uh, Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 66. The living righteous will receive the seal of God prior to the close of probation. Also, that these will enjoy special honors in the kingdom of God. And so she's speaking specifically about those of us living today, just before the end of time. And we've studied this um, at length, that we're living in the last days. If you remember um, <clears throat> the message, Sunday is coming, we could see clearly that all of the pieces are in place and we're very close. And so those of us living that are righteous are going to receive the seal of God prior to the close of probation. And those that do will receive special honors in heaven. So I want to talk about loyalty a little bit. Um, Romans 6, 16. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So it's about being loyal to the creator. It's about being loyal to the creator. And... Uh, it's, I, it is vital, this understanding here. Um, this is not about earning your way to heaven, but we're going to see clearly from Scripture that loyalty to God is vital if we're going to receive the seal of God. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth what? The will of my Father which is in heaven. And who is speaking here? That's right. Jesus is speaking here. And he says that not everyone that claims to be a Christian, says Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those that do the will of God. Loyalty and faithfulness result in doing the will of God. Can you say amen to that? Amen. All right. Acts 5.29 then Peter's, Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And we know this is an extremely important principle because we know we're heading to a time when man is going to tell us we need to obey or else. And it will be contrary to what God is telling us to do. Do you agree? Okay, good. Then Jesus said, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. So if we want to be a disciple of Jesus, he wants us to continue in his word. It doesn't mean to just read his word and hide it away. It means to live his word, to read it, accept it, and obey it. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a what? Is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And so there's this false teaching that if we just carry on, business as usual, calling ourselves Christians, without a concerted, determined effort to grow in Christ by his grace, thinking that we're heaven-bound because we are Christians, that we're going to make it through no matter what, it will prove to be a fatal mistake. There, there, there are conditions to eternal life. The Bible is full of them. I'll, I'll give you one. 1 John 1, 9, if you com confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's a condition. That little word, if, Right? And so we see that these things, you know, Jesus, we just read several scriptures from Christ himself. You know, um, there are conditions associated with being heaven bound, with receiving the seal of God. In the book of James, it says, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. He's guilty of all. So the law is important. It, it does a couple of things. One, it is... Um, the basis for how God's government runs. So if we reject any part of the law, we will not be happy in God's kingdom because his government runs on this law of love, right? 
The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 that God is love. So it is a transcript of his character. And so if you love him, it means that you love his character. And his law is a transcript of his character. So we should love his law. And, you know, we talked about this in our group uh, last night, our prayer group last night, our study group, that um, the motivation has to be love. And I've mentioned that here before. But I often encounter Christians who are fed up with the law. It's a burden. It's all you can't do this and you can't do that. You've got to do this and you've got to do that. That's an unconverted person speaking. Because a person who is converted loves the Lord Jesus for what he's done, wants to serve him, wants to do everything that he asks. They will never say, oh, the law is a burden. All these do's and don'ts. So the converted heart wants to please the Savior. Mark 7, 7, how be it in vain, Jesus said, do they worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men? For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men. This has and is a serious problem. Laying aside the commandments of God Or like the first king of Israel, Saul, do most of what God says, but the unpleasant things or the difficult things or the things that I love, I'm going to hold on to those. So I draw your attention to uh, 1 Samuel. And we're in chapter 15. And you can turn there in your Bibles if you want. I have the scriptures there up on the screen for you. But 1 Samuel 15, 3 says, uh, Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. There's a pretty clear uh, commandment from God. Spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox, sheep, camel, and ass. And what did Saul do? But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatling and of the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, they destroyed utterly. So they took God's clear commandment about what to do, because God knows best. And Saul altered it and decided, well, I know better than God. There are some things that are worth keeping alive, so I'm going to do that. But the things that are vile and, you know, garbage will destroy those things and This goes on today. Pick and choose uh, the things that we want to be obedient to and discard the unpleasantries. And just say, well, those things don't really matter. And and what what did Saul say to Samuel when Samuel confronted him on this? He goes, you know, what's the bleeding of these sheep that I hear? What did Saul say? All the things that God has told me to do. Well, that's, that's coming up. But, but Saul's response was, I did everything God said to do. But he didn't. He didn't. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? So what's most important? Obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Mark uh, chapter 7 and verse 9. And he saith unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Are we doing that? Do we, do we reject portions of Scripture or the spirit of prophecy to maintain our own traditions or our own habits or to cling to those things that we love? Because remember, the Bible says that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of who? Of Jesus. That's right. It's not the testimony of a little old lady. It's the testimony of Jesus who used the little old lady to share those things. And so if we reject her, we're rejecting the testimony of Jesus. And if we reject Scripture, we're rejecting Jesus, right? Because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so this is very serious because this this message is a follow-up to the message that we had, Sunday is coming. 
And, and we recognize there that what man wants us to do is going to be in direct conflict to what God wants us to do. And we need to get to a place where we're not compromising God's word. Because if we're compromising God's word now, we're told it will be an easy thing to go the way of the world and receive the mark of the beast, right? So this is, this is important. It may not be easy to hear, but it's right from God's word. No man can serve two masters, Jesus said, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. So no fence sitters in the kingdom of God. There's no middle ground, although there are people who are trying to do that now. They're trying to keep a hand in the world and reach up for Jesus. And, you know, I'm going to play both sides of the fence. Very soon, everyone will have to make a final choice. It'll mean that we have to choose either one side or the other. There'll be no middle ground. The sooner we make that choice, the sooner we purpose in our hearts that we're making the side of obedience to God and following Jesus and trusting in him, the better off we are. You know, the Bible says that we are not to follow a multitude to do evil. So just because the majority of people are going in a particular direction, does it, not, it does not make the activity, whatever it is, safe or righteous. And the same is true with doctrine. If the majority of people are heading in a particular direction, uh, spiritually, we must be careful. That's why you have your own Bible, so that you can check whatever you're being taught, whatever you're hearing from the pulpit. You can check. So I put these things up on the screen so you can see it coming from God's Word. But we're counseled not to follow the multitude to do evil because we have seen historically that the crowd is often wrong. That's right. They're usually heading in the wrong direction, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. And the majority of people are going to compromise God's word and they're going to go the way of the world and they're going to say, we need to get along. We need to show love for people and you're creating a problem and why can't you just get along and conform? You'll hear those words, conformity. And, and they'll throw love in there. You are not loving. How many people were told that they were hate mongers because they wouldn't get a vaccine, that they wouldn't wear a mask everywhere that they went, right? That's what they, that's what they accused us of doing. You hate people. You're not a Christian if you won't go and get the jab. And so that's just a, a, a little sample of what's coming. It's serious stuff. Jesus said, enter ye in at the what gate? At the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which goeth in thereat. So the majority of people, here it is, they're heading into the broad road to, distract, to destruction. But Jesus goes on, he says, but straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And hopefully that's every person here, that we will choose the narrow way, the straight gate. And, and that word in the Greek, it means difficulties close at hand. It is narrow, it's straight, because there's difficulties here and there's difficulties here. There's trouble here and there's trouble here. And we have to stay on that narrow path. The wide gate is easy. It's broad. Everyone's doing it. In the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. See, the reason is the same. They went with the multitude to do evil. You know, it's very convincing when a dozen people tell you the same thing. It's like, wow, I keep hearing that. I keep hearing that. And that can be a good thing, right? It can be affirmation, but it also could be a bad thing. You know, sometimes uh, maybe you'll see this uh, during the holidays when you get together with family that aren't Christian. And the majority of them are doing a certain thing. And there can be this push or this draw to just kind of go with the multitude. I have a huge family. I don't know about you. But family gatherings, um, sometimes we avoid them on purpose because of this one principle. 
there's that, there's that pull, that draw to follow the crowd. And, and I suspect that it was a very difficult thing to follow Noah and his family at that time. It took a decided effort to say, you know, man, it's all of these people, all of my family members, but I know in my heart that this is what's right. It must have been very difficult. We'll face the same. The Bible says, Ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Are we prepared for that? How many have lost friends when you became a Christian? When you became an Adventist, because you're a strange Christian if you're an Adventist, right? Because you keep, you keep Saturday, right? But that's actually the Bible Sabbath. But you're still strange because you're doing something the majority of people aren't doing. I lost friends. My wife lost friends. I'm sure just about everybody did. So we go back to um, Revelation 7, 3. Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. So we're talking about the forehead again. Why the forehead? Well, the frontal lobe controls thinking, judgment, decision-making, and reasoning, as well as executive functions such as self-control. Some people have experienced some severe head injuries to the frontal lobe. Their personalities change, and oftentimes they have no self-control. They're just totally different people. So when the Lord is saying he wants to seal us here, it's where we reason, where we judge, where we make decisions, where, where we control ourselves, because it will require self-control to follow God completely. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So we see here, this is the third angel's message. It's at the end of Revelation 14, showing the contrast to those who are lost and it says that God has a group of people, they're, they're patient saints, they, they have steadfast endurance, and they keep, and that word in the Greek, it means to guard the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And this is all part of the everlasting gospel. So we're talking about the seal of God, and we're, we're also always trying to apply it to the everlasting gospel. In Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12, it says, Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbath to be a what? To be a sign, and that word is synonymous with seal, between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies or makes them holy. So God is saying, I identify my people by the day that they keep. The Sabbath keepers are mine. And hallow my Sabbath, this is verse 20, same chapter, and they shall be a sign or a seal between me and you. So he, he's got this personal thing going with you. And he says, Sabbath keeping is a sign between you and me that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Now, we can't forget that, or we must keep in mind that it's not just Sabbath keeping. See, I think... When, the, when we look at these verses, what God is trying to tell us, among other things, is that s true Sabbath keeping is going to be the most difficult commandment to keep. And if you'll keep the Sabbath commandment, you're already keeping the other nine. Think about it. This is going to be the most difficult commandment to keep. Ellen White says it's the test for the remnant people. It's going to be so hard to remain faithful in the Sabbath, that all the other commandments, they'll, they'll be kept by the Sabbath keepers. And that's how God is able to identify. He says, hey, if you're keeping the Sabbath, I know you're keeping the others. Because this is the most going to be the most difficult one to keep. It's easy to do now. And in some places, uh, especially you know, in the United States, we have little Adventist hubs where it's what everybody does. It's popular to be a Sabbath keeper in certain places. It's easy to do it now, right? If you're having trouble doing it now, get, you know, pray. Ask God to help you. But for the most part, it's pretty easy to do now. There's not much persecution going on uh, as a result of Sabbath keeping. But it's going to come. 
Evangelism, page 235. God has given, me this, has given men the Sabbath as a sign between him and them, as a test of their what? Loyalty. Those who, after the light regarding God's law comes to them, continue to disobey and exalt human laws above the law of God in the great crisis before us will receive the mark of the beast. The sign or seal of God is revealed in the observance of the seventh-day Sabbath, the Lord's memorial of creation. The mark of the beast is the opposite of this, the observance of the first day of the week. This mark distinguishes those who acknowledge this, the supremacy of the papal authority from those who acknowledge the authority of God. And so we see a polarization. It has to happen. The only way that God can truly identify his people is by allowing everyone to be faced with the same test. The information is going to go out, everyone's going to hear it, and then everyone will make a choice. Only two camps. The Sabbath will be the what? The great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth especially controverted. It's going to be talked about. Everyone's going to be talking. There's going to be people arguing about it. There's going to be hot tempers, and hopefully everybody here will be calm, and there will be no arguing. We'll just be presenting the truth. But this is going to happen. Then the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, and that's men and women, boys and girls. Then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve Him not. See, it's all about worship. It was about worship in heaven when Satan and the, the third of the angels rebelled and were cast out. It was about worship in the Garden of Eden when Eve and then Adam decided, we're going to do what Satan says. And in essence, they were worshiping Satan. And then it, it's been about worship when Jesus came and he had his wilderness of temptation. It was about worship. Satan took him up and said, I'll give you all of this if you just bow down and worship me. And it continues to be about who we worship today, right up until the end. And so there's only two groups, those who worship the true God and those who worship Satan and whatever he presents. He's going to present all kinds of stuff. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment. So as you go through life, just say, is this contrary to what God has said? And you have your answer. And he, is, and he has reduced it down to 10 commandments, Exodus chapter 20. And so we can look at uh, whatever is presented and say, does this fit with what God has said? While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in observance to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to who? To the Creator, right? It's the evidence of our loyalty. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receives the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receive the seal of God. That's what we should desire, right? We want to be sealed by God because those that are sealed will never be lost. They, they will make it through. We need that seal of God before the great time of trouble, before Jacob's trouble. And yes, we're going to wrestle with God, but we need to receive that seal. Ephesians 4.30 warns us, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. See, the Holy Spirit wants to seal us until the day of redemption, but we can grie grieve the Holy Spirit away in the things that we do, say, act, and think. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ do what? Depart from iniquity. I love it. The, the, the Lord knows those that are his. 
and he is able to identify his people. He tells us, depart from iniquity, which is just another way of saying sin. Depart from sin. Jesus said this. I love these verses. John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they what? They follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So Jesus is telling us, he's saying, follow me, don't follow the world. Follow me, don't follow the crowd. And you're going to be just fine. We want to be prepared to meet Jesus, right? He tells us to watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So if that's your desire. If you want to be sealed by the seal of the living God, you're willing to do what God wants you to do, I invite you to kneel and I will, I'll lead us in prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we um, desire to prepare to meet Jesus. We, we want to see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. We want to uh, have our arms open wide, just longing for him to come. And we recognize from Scripture that um, you're, you're going to seal your people. Um, we want to be sealed, Lord. And, and some of what is going to be necessary to receive the seal of God is going to be necessary. And difficult. Lord, we, uh, we're going to need your grace. We're going to need your power, your help. We're going to have to claim promises, as, as we heard in the children's story today, how important that is. We're going to need to be on our knees. We're going to need to be praying and pleading with heaven. It's, it's not going to be an easy experience. Um, we're, we're coming into a time of great difficulty. You have warned us beforehand. So, Lord, give us the power to... Uh, based on a motivation of love for you to desire to keep your commandments. Not to be burdened by them, but to, to love them and, and to recognize that it is um, the principle of love that your government runs on, that it describes your character. And if we love you, we love your law because we love your love and character. So, Lord, make a change where a change is necessary. Give us power where we need power. Give us hope where we need hope. We'll give you the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, Pastor. It's a powerful message. We need to be sealed within and without, do we not? That's my prayer for all of us today. If you stand with me, uh, let's, let's close with, uh, Oh, Brother, Be Faithful, page 602.
the good and the blessed. It's waiting its portals of pearls to unfold and welcome the end to thy rest. Brother, proof faithful, not long shall we stay in weariness here and forlorn. Time's dark night of sorrow is wearing away. We haste to the glorious morn. Omnipotent King, while legions of angels his chariot attend, and palm wreaths of victory bring. Brother, be faithful, and soon thou shalt hear thy Savior pronounce the glad word. Well done, faithful servant, thy title is clear to answer the joy of thy Lord. Oh, amen. <laughs> Shall tell for thy faithfulness bright smiles of gladness shall scatter thy tears a coronet and gleam on thy brow you sound so beautiful when you're smiling there be faithful the promise is sure that waits for the faithful and try to reign with the ransom the mortal and pure and ever with Jesus abide. Have a blessed Sabbath, everybody. Please allow the deacons to, or, or the ushers to escort you out. And uh, fellowship in the, in the foyer, please. Thank you. Happy Sabbath.